special study session, May 22nd. Um, I would like to welcome everybody here. We also have people in an overflow room. Um, so we'll have everything televised there also. But if anybody is in the overflow room and you walk slowly and orderly, we still have some seats for you in the main room. So if people are sitting over there, you don't have to. Um, first of all, I would just like to say thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, this current board is going to be faced with some decision in the future about what happens to our properties north of the downtown campus. No decision has been made. Discussions have happened, but nothing is in stone. We're not sure what we want to do. We haven't seen all of the possibilities yet. The reason we're having this meeting today is because a lot of you have information, knowledge, and expertise that we would like you to share with the board so when we make our decision, we're fully informed. So thank you for being here. Um, in, I was faculty, as many of you know, and in 2017 when these uh, uh, properties were purchased, I went before um, all faculty day and I stood up and I made a statement saying that why are we buying properties when we're in a financial not positive uh, situation at the college. We hadn't had salary raises for a, a long time. I was frustrated and upset. So I understand what everybody is here for. You're here to give your impression and your experience and your knowledge. So we're going to limit it to three minutes and um, we would we are expecting everybody to follow that time limit and then also we want to have um, everybody be, if you're not speaking, if you're in the audience, be an active listener. Make sure you're hearing what the speaker is saying, see how that melds with your idea. And then when it's your turn to talk, if you have already spoken, I mean, if someone has already spoken almost exactly the same words that you were planning on speaking, you might not need to use your whole three minutes and maybe save your time for somebody else who would like to speak if, if we go beyond, you know, we're gonna end this meeting also at six o'clock, so we have two hours to speak. And then lastly, just let's be respectful of everybody, right? Um, we received the board, received lots of emails. Uh, many of us responded to as many as we could. Um, and we appreciate when they're polite and when you share ideas and um, options with us. It's not fun when people say that we've, you know, committed crimes and broke the laws and decided about whatever. So just let's remember to everybody be positive and supportive of the board and the people who are up here speaking. So thank you in advance. Also, go ahead. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so we do have presentations. Um, is all of my technology? Okay. Okay. Thrive in the O5 initiative will be our first presenter. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, my name is Ann Schnecke. I am a deputy director of the Department of Housing and Community Development for the city of Tucson. Um, I'm here to give a very, very brief overview about Thrive in the 05 and some updates in particular that relate to what you're talking about today. And I always like my crutch of a few slides. Okay, so for those that aren't as familiar, a super quick overview of what Thrive in the 05 is. In 2018, three different collaboratives, three different initiatives came together to form a collaboration. Um, one of them, the ASU School of Social Work, got a grant focused on crime and public safety. Us at the city got a grant from Housing and Urban Development called a Choice Neighborhoods Grant. And then um, after an outgrowth of a Daniel Rose Fellowship, 
Pima Community College and um, the city's Office of Economic Initiatives really put together a focused workforce and economic development initiative for the Thrive in the 05. And so I do wanna say thank you so much to Pima Community College. You've been an incredible partner for the past five years working on the Thrive in the 05 Collaborative and really appreciate the time and energy and resources you've been putting into that effort. Um, throughout the three years of planning, um, the, there was three years of planning and then the pandemic started and it was more of service delivery. Throughout that time though, what we listened really intently to neighborhood groups, stakeholders, nonprofits, and we summarized what we heard in a Thrive in the 05 transformation plan that's available on the city's website. It really outlines what we heard for Thrive in the 05 area. So summarizing many, many years of planning into one slide, there were countless festivals, charrettes, open houses. Um, we've been paying community ambassadors to help us with engagement, really wanting to hear from the community what is, what do they want for Thrive in the 05? And Thrive in the 05 in terms of boundaries on the south end is, is more or less Speedway. So Pima Community College downtown campus on the south end, Stone on the east end, I-10 on the west end. Not gonna read all this, um, but this is part of the transformation plan. There are four key areas and workforce and economic development and really trying to integrate what Pima Community College is doing is one of those four areas. And then a couple more um, recent updates. So our planning grant we received in 2018 also came with action activity monies. And those are smaller projects to jumpstart implementation. And so one of them, if you've been along Drachman Avenue recently, you may have seen the Miracle Mile, Historic Miracle Mile signage that's going up. So um, as part of those action activities, HUD has given us money to do more branding along the whole Drachman, Oracle, and Miracle Mile historic gateway. This um, January, it feels like it was a long time ago at this point, but it was this year, we submitted a grant application to Housing and Urban Development. This is the Choice Neighborhoods Implementation Grant. It's a $50 million grant. And so we submitted it in January. We will find out whether or not we are getting this grant in July. Good news is Tucson is a finalist for consideration. They announced, publicly announced those last month. Um, and we're still not guaranteed. So there's still more finalists than there are grants available. Um, if we do get the grant, it's an eight year grant. So we have eight years to deliver what we wrote and put in our grant application. And then even though it sounds like a lot of money and it is a lot of money, the majority of that grant will go towards rehabilitating the Tucson house. You can imagine what that cost looks like. And so that's really the key focus. However, there are three core goals area. There's housing and that's where the majority of the funding would go. There's services for folks living at the Tucson house and the other sites that we proposed. And then there's a neighborhood category. And I bring that up because there are five, we proposed five projects in our grant proposal under the neighborhood category. And um, this is my last slide. One of them, we really worked with the leadership of Pima Community College at the time and proposed a what we're calling a Drachman Gateway. So um, what that would be is uh, we, we submitted a draft budget for $1,750,000 of the HUD money to really help build out the public access to the community hub and also the, the public plaza area of the community hub. So almost $2 million of the, the HUD funding. And so the thinking there, and we do have, um, we did submit a support letter, a commitment letter from Pima Community College with our grant application. In it, um, there were sort of a, a few different commitments Pima Co Community College made. 
One is um, having there be this community hub. And in the letter, it specifically talked about $8.3 million was the minimum amount. Um, understandably, wanted to kind of keep that dollar amount open. So the letter specifically said a minimum of $8.3 million for the community hub. There would be public access. We'd be, we'd be supporting that and a, a public plaza area with the understanding some of it would have to be um, more secured, but there would be an area that would be open to the public. And really the way the support letter is written, it talks about the Innovation Center, the S Center for DEI, and the Center for o Entrepreneurship. The letter also outlines so how choice works. You can, anything that's budgeted that you can show is programmed in the future, you can count. And so um, the list included about $8 million of additional projects. So the whole support letter was about $16 million worth of investment from PCC to support the overall efforts. So I'm here, um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but at least wanted to give you an update on Thrive in the 05 and help answer any questions. Okay, so you're saying there's $16 million, so is that? 16. 16, one six. Yeah, one six. Correct. Okay, now, so was that money that was gonna be committed to Pima College? It was money coming from Pima College. From Pima. And, yeah. To to, to the effort, and it's it's really money that my understanding was budgeted in the PCC budget. So not additional funding, but what was included in the PCC budget. So an example, the science and technology building remodel, my understanding is is already budgeted for five million. So that's part of that 16 million. So I have a question for the chancellor, thank you. Yeah. So, so when did that, so at the Centers of Excellence, is this part of what she's talking about? So this was all part of the overall Center of Excellence projects that we've discussed with the board in the past. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So Chancellor, the, in terms of these commitments that were made in this letter, does any of this presuppose the adaptive reuse of those hotel buildings or is this other project separate from the hotel? I'm just trying to make sure I get it straight in my head. So without going back and looking at the details, this is off the top of my head, right? So we factored in all of what we're doing in terms of the centers of excellence in integrating different components, which this is a component of what we're envisioning. Uh, and so adaptive reuse of existing facilities, renovation of facilities were part of the overall plan. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation is an overview of academic programs and student services at the downtown campus from uh, Dr. Dolores Duran Cerda, Provost, and Nina Corson, the campus vice president of the downtown campus. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Riel, Vice Chair McLean, members of the board, Chancellor Lambert, colleagues and guests. I'm here, I'm the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and accompanying me is our Downtown Campus Vice President, Nina Corson. And we'll be giving uh, a little bit of context of the academic offerings that are taking place at the Downtown Campus. So first I'll pass it off to Nina. Thank you. Um, Dolores and I are gonna kind of bounce back and forth and hope to give you an overview of the campus. So Pima Community College's downtown campus is in the heart of Tucson, right at the cross streets of a major intersection at Speedway and Stone. It is our second largest in-person campus, and we have served over 4,200 individual learners this academic year with almost 10,000 enrollments. Our downtown campus now has approximately 400,000 square feet of space in use across 14 buildings. These numbers do not include the newly acquired social, Catholic social service buildings, nor do they include the hotel properties we're speaking of today. Our downtown campus has that cool urban vibe with classes going from 7 a.m. in the morning until 10 p.m. at night. It is the perfect blend of old and new. <clears throat> in fact, 
The photo that you're looking at, I, I took last week, up on the third floor of the brand new state-of-the-art advanced manufacturing building, yet it focuses on the 102-year-old Roosevelt Building. Our student population is diverse. Though the majority of our learners are traditionally aged, the downtown campus has a larger percentage of learners over 40 than any other campus. Last fall, um, those 40 and over made up about 11% of our headcount. The downtown campus is also near several centers of refugee populations, and it is not uncommon to hear four or five different languages spoken in one day as you walk across the campus. We're also down the street from the University of Arizona and a convenient spot for those U of A students to take a class that they can't get at the university or that frankly they would just rather take from us. So go ahead. Thank you. So the downtown campus is near and dear to me because I was a faculty member there for 10 years and I taught in the Roosevelt Building World Languages. So this academic year, our faculty taught 49 disciplines at the downtown campus. And recently we've heard the, about the ribbon cutting, about the um, advanced manufacturing building, our center of excellence, the applied technology programs. And in these programs, we offer automotive technology, we offer welding, automated industrial technology, machining, CAD, which is computer-aided drafting, and also building and construction trades. One out of four downtown campus students is enrolled in one of these programs. Our applied technology division includes about 30% of the enrollment of the campus. 70% at the downtown campus enrollment is gen eds. The discipline that has the most enrollment at the downtown campus is mathematics. And in addition to a host of transferable gen ed courses, we also that are unique to the downtown campus have an abundance of languages. As Nina said, you walk down the campus and you can hear a variety of languages. We teach ESL, Chinese, French, Spanish, Japanese, and Korean. We also have the translation studies interpretation program there. And by a large margin, the majority of our students on campus intend to transfer with an associate arts to the University of Arizona, ASU, or NAU. But our next most enrolled programs at the downtown campus are the Associate in Science for transfer, and also the Associate of Business Administration for transfer, as well as automotive technology, welding, and paralegal. Now, Nina. Okay, thanks. So as the campus vice president, whoops, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, it is my goal to ensure that every learner on campus has provided a rich experience. Rather they're in one of the original parts of campus that you see in this photo, or on one of our brand new parts of campus. Now since moving to the downtown campus last March, I've learned quite a bit of the campus history. For instance, many assume that our original campus or our original classes took place right there in the Roosevelt Building. <clears throat> it's not true, I see. I see one of our board members knows that's not true at all. As it turns out, in 1974, when the campus opened, the very first classes were, you, were took place in a remodeled post office that happens to be where our library is right now. The downtown campus has a long history of adaptively reusing buildings when it made sense to do so or demolishing the buildings and creating something new when that meant, when that made more sense to do so instead. Go ahead. So at the downtown campus, we serve comprehensively all students. And so we provide an array of student services, which includes enrollment in program advising, career advising and counseling, summer bridge programs, financial aid services, tutoring, academic support and coaching, we also have a supportive veteran center and a comprehensive student life programming. Also at the downtown campus, we house the Adult Education Administration and the Immigrant and Refugee Resource Center, 
as well as the ethnic gender transborder studies and sociology programs at the downtown campus. And it is also the favored campus location for our popular Super Saturday enrollment events. All right, as you can see, the downtown campus is a happening place and one that continually morphs. A majority of the college's internal and external public and large events are held in the amethyst room. I'm sure you've all been there. And we have more and more events taking place in the new Azerite room. Many exciting changes are coming too. Some that our college is leading, and some that our community partners are leading. You heard just now from the Thrive in the 05 partners, but also soon the 9th Avenue Castro Bicycle Boulevard will be improved and run right through our campus. There are future plans for our community's light rail extension, the Tucson Norte Sur, which includes a stop planned on Drockman right at the edge of our campus. We have long range, long range, tentative plans to demolish the Catholic Social Service Building and potentially create a university partner joint use facility there at that location. We also hope to create a Veterans Memorial Park on campus. And of course, we have ongoing needs for regular upgrades to ensure our existing older facilities are just as state of the art as our newer facilities. So I'll talk a little bit about future plans. So one of them is to move the workforce development team that's located here at a district office to the downtown campus as well as a small business development center. The downtown campus will also accommodate expanded industry training and several community partnerships. The programs that are housed in the east wing of the ST building and where the applied technology staff and programs are going to be moving out of. In addition, the west wing of the ST building will be renovated to allow much more expansion than uh, for our building and construction technologies program known as BCT. We train um, the community's future electricians, plumbers, HVAC workers, mason workers, carpenters, all in a small portion of the ST West building. We will soon be able to expand the programs to show, uh, allow, excuse me, the physical space necessary for those programs that are growing and have heavy equipment simulation. And we'll finally be able, be able to move our cabinet making program that currently is at the MNS site to the downtown campus. So I hope Nina and I were able to provide some context of the downtown campus, what's currently being offered and future plans, but we'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you. Our next presentation is from Dan Mayer, Director of Architecture from GLHN Architect Architects and Engineers on the assessment of the hotel properties. Uh, thank you all for uh, having me here today. Um, again, yeah, my name is Dan Maher. I'm the Director of Architecture for GLHN Architects and Engineers. We were awarded the Adaptive Reuse Project on the downtown hotels properties in April of 2022. Um, we have been working uh, over the, the course of the last year uh, with the Pima Community College end users um, and various different groups um, to create the program that we would move forward uh, during the design and construction documents phase of this project. Uh, we have a... Is that better? Yeah, yes. All right. So I will, I'll, I'll give the overview there again. Um, we have been uh, engaged with Pima Community College um, during the programming uh, phase ahead of the design and construction documents phase of this project. So to be clear, we um, have gotten this to um, the identified end users, um, some space planning, um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in, um, in, in slides moving forward here. So 
So we've had a number of different programming meetings with um, uh, the identified end users from Pima Community College. That has been a shifting target over the course of the last year, um, and we've been working with um, the Pima Community College uh, project managers um, as we narrow down what end users would be in this uh, facility. So these are some images from those meetings that we had. We started with some visioning exercises as to what these properties could be. Um, there was tremendous engagement from the end users um, as to what they saw the future of these properties and how it could engage the community at large, um, as well as the student body uh, and administration as well. So these are some of those images. One of the things that we do when we go through these programming exercises um, is we create heat maps and things like that of images that, that um, really resonate with the end users, what they hope to see out of these uh, these facilities, we don't really talk about the spaces at that point. It's more um, understanding what the needs of, of the users and what these, uh, what the potential is. Um, we had uh, some slide decks that we worked through um, with very open-ended questions and, and words um, to understand, again, uh, what they saw the potential for these properties to be. Um, and then this is the heat map that I, uh, I discussed. So looking at these um, from just uh, an understanding perspective of w what items really resonated with people is, is, is essentially where we got to with this. Where we did the bulk of the heavy lift was on what we call the project charter, and this is the understanding of what the project would be for uh, Pima Community College as our, as our client and how we would engage uh, the public uh, and the end users, the administration, and the student body. Um, this was uh, an important part of this process for us, um, and this is, this is part of the documentation that we have issued to Pima Community College. So the four different uh, user groups that were identified uh, eventually that would go into these properties are um, the Innovation Lab, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, uh, the Teaching and Learning Center, and also Education Technology. So when we distilled this information, we came up with gross square footages that each one of these programs would be using um, to uh, allocate those spaces to them so that we could move forward with a design process. Uh, this, the slide that you're seeing here is for the Innovation Center. Um, the Teaching and Learning Center. No, I believe actually they're all um, education technology. Sorry, I skipped over. Um, and then DEI as well. So what we derived from that were rough gross square footages of the requirements of these end users, right? So what you're seeing um, on the screen or on your screens is the gross square footages of the properties themselves. So um, I jumped ahead a little bit there. Um, at the beginning of this project, uh, we were tasked with uh, going through and creating a um, feasibility study for these properties. This is not the first feasibility study that was completed. There were two previous uh, feasibility studies which addressed um, some of the um, uh, opportunities and constraints of these properties for Pima Community College to use them as they saw fit. Um, so that's part of how we arrived at these, uh, um, at these diagrams for those, those properties. So we took the requirements of the end users um, and we arrived at a gross square footage, it's very blurry up there, of roughly 14,000 square feet um, which were required. So as we started to overlay, we didn't do full test fits or anything like that and looking at where these uh, opportunities existed um, and presented themselves for co-location of these end user groups. It really washes out. Uh, we started uh, understanding that the Tucson Inn property would probably be best suited to the Innovation Center. Um, education technology would be uh, nearby, Teaching and Learning Center, um, as these things kind of cascaded across uh, the various different properties. Now, I should note that that 14,000 square feet uh, required by the end users is not come close to um, fitting all of the square footages of the three hotel properties. Um, their, their gross square footages are, are in excess of that. So as part of the feasibility study, we went through all of the properties um, uh, extensively. We, uh, we did a full scan of the interior of all of those properties. Um, we did assessments of the structure of the interior finishes of the uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems. Um, and um, essentially a full documentation. Again, Pima Community College has all of that documentation um, 
if, if you'd like to look at it more extensively. Um, a lot of people, however, have not been inside these properties because they are closed and they're boarded up. Um, so some of the images that, uh, that you're going to see here are of the interiors there. So this is of the Tucson Inn. This is the backside of the diner building. Um, structurally, for the most part, uh, this part of the Tucson Inn is, is in uh, uh, fine shape. You know, there, there are things that need to be done to it, obviously, but um, there weren't structural deficiencies that we saw elsewhere throughout uh, these buildings. This is um, the diner property there. Um, one of the main issues that we are starting to see is that there are water intrusion issues throughout um, all, all three property buildings. Um, these images here are um, actually from the city of Tucson. This is from when um, the Tucson Inn property was, was condemned. There are some structural concerns uh, related to where the electrical equipment sits. And this is the back half of the Tucson Inn. Uh, this area is not accessible because it's simply not safe for people to go inside. Um, the Copper Cactus Inn, uh, these buildings are in better shape, I would say, than especially the back half of the, of the Tucson Inn. And they're in various uh, states of repair and disrepair. Um, the image on the left there, I think, is important because you could essentially shower in that, in that, that property right now. Um, but it's juxtaposed with, with other issues that, that they have. So Pima Community College has engaged uh, with a construction manager at risk on this project. Um, we have never gotten, uh, as the design professional, we have never gotten to a point where there have been any uh, cost estimations done at the level of drawings that we, we have produced. Um, there have, um, what has, taken place is what is happening in the construction market right now, which we have seen uh, unprecedented ex escalation um, across the market. Um, and so from a high level, the rough square footage uh, uh, of these properties uh, multiplied by what we are seeing in the market um, has generated some of these, these should not be referred to as cost estimates. Um, they are, um, or budgets, um, they're simply what um, an S, you know, uh, an allocation of what potentially the, the the renovation could cost. There's been nothing that has been bid or designed or, or anything to that um, uh, to that effect. So I believe Brandy. Hi everybody, Chancellor Lambert, Board Real, Chair Board Real, and the rest of the board members. I wanted to just real quick go over the slide that. Thank you. I wanted to real quick go over the slide that we talked about um, on April 24th, just as a refresher. Um, so what we're looking at here is the downtown properties. There are four options listed. The first one would include a renovation of 26,000 square feet and a demolition of approximately 20,000 square feet. Um, and the number that you just saw from Dan is a number that was produced by um, a national estimating firm. So they get their information countrywide. Um, the $625 a square foot that you saw um, was actually in Phoenix and when it was provided to us, they qualified it saying, if you have a special use building, then it could go as high as $1,000 a square foot. Now you're aware that many of our um, Center of Excellence projects are special use buildings. So with the estimates that we created, we used a $650 per square foot number. Um, so the, as I said, the first number, the 35.7, is the amount that we found for 26,000, approximately 26,000 square feet renovated, 20,000 demoed. The funded amount that you see there, the $10 million, that's an allocation that was never intended to represent a project budget, rather an amount that was set aside so that we could go through this process that Dan just described and then get into construction and um, at that point understand truly what the budget would be. I'm grateful to Dan for having qualified the project budget number. It is a budget number, it's not an estimate. Um, those happen after we've gone through design and start looking at documents. Um, so the 
would be the Tucson Inn sign, as well as 4,000 square feet of renovation. That would be the kitchen photos that Dan showed to you that are just below the Tucson Inn sign. The 17.3 would be that 4,500 square foot renovation, as well as an additional 6,000 square feet. And you hear, when you're hearing that, you're hearing that those alternatives are less than the program that was defined. The first option, the 35.7, is the option for all programs. Um, and then the last one, the 3.6, would be to maintain the signage and dem demolish all of the structures. Um, I'm not sure if Dan said this, sorry to repeat him if he did already say this. Um, however, the Tucson Inn, the back of the Tucson Inn has um, been declared, gosh, and the, the word is escaping me right now, but it's completely weak, unoccupiable. Um, so we have always, as was noted, um, considered that to be a space that would be demolished. And I can, I'm happy to take any questions. And I'll be here for the remainder. You want to? Is that a little? Oh. I'll repeat your question so it comes. Okay. I can't turn the mic on because then the. Does that one better? Okay, oh, you can you hear me a little bit better at that? Um, I'm in. I will admit that math is not my strong suit, nor nearly as well as Teresa's is, but I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out where that $35 million number came from because, I mean, I heard 14,000 square feet, and even at the high end of what you were saying, the estimate was, when I multiply that in my head, I'm getting 8 million, I'm assuming 8 million something, I'm assuming there's demolition, but then you said 20,000 square feet a second? I'm, try, I'm just hard, I'm trying to follow. Can you just break down for me everything that's in that $35.7 million? Give me, give me one second, I'm gonna pull up a, a slide that has that information. I'm not gonna pull it up, I don't have it in this computer. But I will, I will share with you what's in it. All right. So I'm going to the hotel option number one, and here's the exact numbers. So it was 26,750 square feet that would be renovated, and 22,693 that would be demolished. If we take that approximately 26,000 square feet and multiply it by the six, well, actually we multiplied it by 600. So we didn't go the full 650 on this project. We come to 16 million. And then we also have, as part of the construction, I, we mentioned last time, that the infrastructure needs on this project are great. And so we're assigning 25% of those costs to infrastructure needs. And then we have um, abatement needs, demolition needs. Um, those are separate costs from the number that you just heard. Every project that we talk about, when we're talking about construction budgets, we're talking about 70% of the project cost. Another 30% of the cost goes to our designers, to our engineers, to our inspectors, to our permit process. We also have money that gets assigned to furniture, fixture, and equipment, AVIT. Um, let me see what I might have missed. M move, move costs. Um, now we're getting down into the nitty gritty, but I, that kind of gives you an idea. And we also like to have a project contingency because as we're going through these projects, especially if it's an existing property, we are going to find things that we didn't know about. And so um, rather than continue to ask you for additional money, additional money, additional money, we like to include a little bit of a contingency. I hope that helps. Okay. Um so, Randy, thank you so much for the information. I have been asking specifically for the cost breakdowns, okay, because I realized from the beginning that originally the $10 million for, or $14 million that we actually budgeted uh, last year, you know, did not, it wasn't specific as to what exactly was going to be needed. I've recently built a home, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Everything costs money, and yes, Materials have been, have well tripled in cost. Cement, plywood. Uh, but thank you so much for the breakdown. I, I really, you know, in order for the board to make a good decision on how we spend 
our taxpayers' money, including that these costs not only are going to cost the taxpayer, but also increase in tuition, okay? So it's better for us to know what we're voting on. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Dan, I have a quick question. Will you just share with the board, we've heard some things just casually that when you all were, and maybe not you, but maybe the city, when you were inspecting and you found some problems with the utilities that no one was aware of. Are you are you familiar with what I'm talking about by any chance? Can about you expound on that? Possibly, but can you just can you expound on that? I, I just I thought I heard something that when they started looking into the buildings, they realized that in order to bring them up, they were also going to have to do all sorts of upgrades to the utilities because some utilities were either buried in certain places that weren't legal anymore or that sort of thing. Correct. So during again. There were three different feasibility studies by three different design firms that have taken place on these on these properties over the years. Almost all of us have addressed some of these issues. Um, we were simply the most recent. Um, so there, there's there's two different ways to answer that. Um, we did look at it from an, an architectural and mechanical, electrical, and plumbing perspective as to what it would take to bring these buildings up to to being occupiable and safe. Um, so we have noted that in our, our report. Um, in addition to that, there are site utilities, which is what Brandy mentioned, um, um, you know, that need to be addressed so that these can be, these can be viable. And, and that is something that, that can be done. We have made um, our assessment of, of how we could do those things. Um, but again, it's, it comes down to how Pima Community College chooses to, to spend that money. So one item that the city did note, which is infrastructure related, is um, the, sorry, the photo, um, the photo on the on uh, most left on this on this slide, um, which is the service entrance for the electrical. Um, it's sitting on the second floor. It's listing. Um, it's its location is no longer code compliant. So there are things like that, and that was noted in the condem condemnation report um, uh, from the city of Tucson. Did that clarify? Okay. They just turned me off. The um, another question there. So I'm just to crosswalk these two presentations, and this might be for the chancellor, but I mean, you might be able to answer it. But so in that letter of they went in with the grant that we were talking about a second ago, I'm just I'm noticing programming similarities. So there were things that were mentioned that, that the college was committing to in that grant thing that went in that sound like they're intended to be housed in these buildings. So I'm just, I'm, again, I'm trying to tie these together in my brain. So um, if these, if we don't do this just for the sake of conversation, if we weren't to pursue this adaptive reuse strategy, is there a plan B for honoring that commitment or do we need to do this in order to fulfill the commitment we made in there? So we're working, oh. sorry, we are working on a plan B. We have two different spaces at the downtown campus that we'd like to visit with the city of Tucson to see if they would be um, appropriate for meeting their needs. Um, the, the really great thing is that um, the workforce development, the diversity, um, equity and inclusion, um, the, gosh, the Innovation Center, and there's one more. What's the other one? Oh, the Learning Center. All of those have similar needs, along with what the City of Tucson is proposing, and it's going to get turned into a thing called a one-stop center, and then that one-stop center allows for our community members to come and go to one place and find their needs being met in that one, one place. So, yes, we're looking at two places. Is it Thursday? Uh, it is. This Thursday. for the one-stop place. By the way, it was the word I was looking for, was condemned. <laughs> Thank you both, we appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. And then our fourth presentation is from Ken Scoville and a group of his fellow enthusiasts, partners. Well, I would have to say historic preservation advocates. Thank okay. you. Uh, Chair uh, Rial and members of the board, Chancellor Lambert, thank you for the time today and thank you for setting this up. 
I think just to give you a quick little background for some of you who probably have different understandings of why this became an historic district and all of this, and I will just try and give you an idea. People in Tucson would come here on foot, wagon, stagecoach, train, uh, uh, airplane, but probably no other medium than the automobile has so greatly impacted Tucson in the 20th century. And Miracle Mile is the northern gateway, automobile gateway into Tucson. Let me see if we can get it any working. And really, as people started exploring and coming out west, there was the first real connection was the old Spanish Trail Highway. In the east, it was uh, US 90, and in the, in the west, US 80. And as you can see, it would go through Tucson and through this way, and essentially down Stone as it came in through downtown and would head to the north. And here's a, and let me get the little laser pointer going here. Here's a nice map of Tucson 1930, and you can see the city of Tucson is just not even the Grant Road yet, population's about 33,000. And you can see our two major uh, really out, outlined corridors, Oracle Road and also Casa Grande Highway. And this idea of a, the Miracle Mile project was there were so many accidents and issues going on that, and here it is, the Casa Grande Highway 1930s. That building you're seeing there is still the building that exists today, over to there. And you can see pretty much out in the country and, and lots of people were coming in exploring automobiles and staying in different places. And there were a lot of automobile accidents. And so this became the first divided highway in Arizona, in Tucson, to have this start evolving. And probably several different meanings for the idea of a miracle mile, but probably the real estate people saw this was going to be a miracle of development. We already had this divided road in, and it was gonna really boom. And, and now you get a good vantage point of that divided roadway. And this would become a major corridor for growth, just like as the automobile is in so many locations in Tucson. And now here's another aerial, and now we're looking south, and you can see the, the northern traffic circle, and there, at one time there was one on the southern end. And you can see the development and things evolving at the time. And here's the, the heyday, the very night, uh, late 1960s, you can see the total build out of Miracle Mile. When the city of Tucson decided to start uh, taking traffic on the interstate freeway and rezoning motels along the freeway, this started the downslide of uh, Miracle Mile that was the heyday entrance for the automobile. And you can see the multitude of motor courts and businesses. And then I think especially for this group and the board consider consideration, this is the frontier right here, and here's the El Rancho. The Tucson Inn has not arrived yet until a little bit in the 60s. And one of the things to think about, not only are they important individually, but they're important together as the streetscape, the historic landscape of these motor courts is a defining element. Just like <clears throat> downtown at the Congress Hotel, it defines the arrival of the railroad in the Congress Hotel is a, as a railroad hotel, here we have motor courts. People wanted to have their car as close to them as possible so they could go out and explore with it and the freedom of the open road and, and the development of Tucson in the West. And just as a suggestion, and, you, and I'm getting confused, and I've been involved in lots of historic preservation projects, all the numbers flying and all the estimates and all those other things. But the, the Tucson Inn is just the recognizable landmark of all the all the motor courts, motor hotels, other than maybe the Ghost Ranch Lodge. This just begs to be some kind of hotel restaurant venue. And it would just, and this is a way of avoiding some of the costs as if you could get a partner, a responsible restaurant in partnership in Tucson to take this over and, and help with the revitalization and the cost of it. When you look at the other two motor courts, You've got all this space in between that you can put, obviously, a contemporary building that would be sympathetic in a way to the architecture that's left up to the architects. But you have plenty of other space to work on to do infill while you're still saving the actual motor courts for different usages. Just recently, I did a preservation for the last remaining department store downtown on Stone. It's now the sort of entrepreneurship innovation center for the U of A, which is at the old Montgomery Wards building. At, uh, on, on, on Stone, and gosh, am I gonna have a senior moment today? On Stone, and, and 
they've adaptively reused all that space, and there's a ton of space there for the students' needs and entrepreneurship and technology and, and working together. This would be one of those motor courts because I've had a lot of people say, I'd like to do a startup business. I need some kind of space to start running my business out of. These little rooms would be excellent, excellent opportunities for that. So there's all kinds of possibilities, and it's just like and what I want to address today again is how we think. How do we think about things? And, and as I travel around the country and visit historic districts and historic areas all across the United States, the main thing that makes areas get revitalized are the historic places in the community. I went to the gas lamp district back in the 70s and 80s in San Diego. If you've been there now, it is the most popular, thriving business economic development in all of San Diego. It used to be worse than Miracle Mile at its worst. So this is the way things get happen and evolve. Downtown's almost finished. Miracle Mile and the historic resources will become very valuable in the very, very near future. And just two other little things I want to show you. I spent three years at the Ghost Ranch Lodge and a much larger project that was $15 million, again, years ago, but they had to actually rebuild rooms and structures. And the developer was just so happy they wanted to level that he kept this and it's one of the most important properties in their whole portfolio. And you want to think about the Tucson house, it's also an historic building and all the issues. And if you notice in this parking lot picture here, bad timing by the businesses, this was supposed to be the place in Tucson for high rise development, but as the economy and change and the changes and patterns on the freeway, that would turn into the issues that it has now. So hopefully you take a different perspective and think about how historic resources and historic places are the key to adaptive reuses. Thank you very much. Our next presenter coming down will be Carlos Lozano. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and board members and Chancellor for allowing us the time to speak. Um, I think uh, Ken did really well with the images, so I, um, but if anyone does not know um, what these properties uh, once looked like in their heyday, um, my images all came from the internet. So you can go to the internet and you really need to see the beauty of, of these buildings. Um, that's okay, Ken. Um, no, that's okay. Um, what I just wanted to say then is, is that if we believe that culture and heritage and history are important to our lives, our community and, and to our society as a whole, if we believe that is true, then that can create a certain responsibility of stewardship. Uh, for example, there are important archeological sites in extremely remote areas whose only protection is the closest rancher. And the rancher didn't ask for that responsibility, they sort of inherited it just by using that, that uh, land. Uh, but in many cases, they shoulder that responsibility and they do it for generation upon generation, uh, protecting those sites. Another example that we see all the time is when um, the city or the state, for instance, does a road widening and they have to purchase properties. Well, they don't, if there are cultural resources on those properties, they become responsible for them and they have to, they really should do the right thing uh, with those, with those uh, resources. Um, even though they didn't intend to inherit them. So I understand um, that the current board is sort of inheriting these buildings that it did, may or may not have asked for, um, but you're, I believe you're inheriting uh, a moral duty to do the right thing. Uh, it's not a legal duty, it's a, moral du it's a moral duty to the community. The good news is, is that unlike an archeological site or a mural, for instance, uh, the Drachman motels can be used productively and, and as was mentioned, um, adaptive reuse ideas could be fast-tracked to actually begin to produce benefit very quickly and, and even income. Um, and there are people in this room and also people who uh, sent in comments that that's their specialty is adaptive reuse and, and, and the, uh, I, I don't even know if you can imagine some of the adaptive reuse projects that we've seen, they're just really impressive and, and, and they, you would not imagine them, uh, but um, 
So um, I think you would find some of these projects very impressive and inspiring, uh, and you would not have thought about them. I'll just close by reminding you that of, of this moral imperative to preserve our heritage, and also remind you that, that local governments and public institutions that serve the community are sort of held to a higher standard uh, than that of uh, just the average developer. Um, and, and I believe that in the end you will do the right thing and, and you'll be glad that you did and you'll be proud of the finished project. You'll find, I believe, that um, it was not as hard as you anticipated and I think you'll find that it won't be as expensive that, as what you thought as well. Um, and um, and I, I hope to be at the ribbon cutting ceremony. So thank you, thank you very much and thanks again for allowing me to speak. Chancellor Lambert and Pima Community College Board, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to speak. My name is JJ Lamb. I'm with the Bale Preservation Society. And I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about the incredible opportunities for education that an adaptive reuse project um, can pr really provide. I'll also share that. Um, I was born in Tucson, I live in Vail now, but this is the area of town that I grew up in. So um, I'll just say I have an affinity and a love for the sense of place um, that these structures can provide, not just during my childhood, but for the neighborhood that lives there now. So what you're looking at in this slide is the 1915 Section Foreman House. And this is a railroad house that Bell Preservation Society purchased and moved to the Esmond Station School. Uh, the Esmond Station School site has a section of rail line that bisects um, the site. And the site council really wanted to showcase that history and help provide a sense of place. And we're looking for how can we do that and how can that adaptive reuse and that sense of place to really serve education. And, and this is really um, where I think Pima Community College is. How can these buildings serve education? Because that's what they need to do. And so, oops, I think I accidentally maybe moved that forward. Okay. <laughs> so what we did, yes, yeah, through a partnership, um, we looked for ways that the building could actually provide hands-on experiential learning. And there, it took, um, because we engaged uh, high school students in the construction tech program. So I'm just gonna put out there that not only can the building serve education when they're adaptively reused and that process is completed, you can use that process effectively to provide hands-on experiential learning for your students in your program. Make this process part of the learning process as well. So we've had students, there's hundreds of students really that over the five years that it took to rehab the building and it takes a little longer, but you're actually providing real experiences. We, our, our little, um, our theme was lifelong learning with local impact. So not only are the students gaining experience, they're doing something real that they know is giving back to their community, not just now, but into the future. So we've had students that went on to become architects. We've had students that um, learned through that adaptive reuse pro um, process um, how to incorporate um, modern mechanical systems. We have students that went on and they're making great salaries, installing HVAC and those kinds of things. We have students that went on uh, to become uh, very successful and sought after welders. Uh, we have students who learned how to uh, restore historic windows. Um, and actually, um, I'll just say that uh, this is, this is a historic preservation research study that Bell Preservation Society participated in 
with um, the University of Arizona and other partners. And as we were in the process of this study, we discovered that there were four simultaneous similar studies happening around the country. And that's because there's a real need for the skills that students learn. There's a shortage of um, individuals with the real skills uh, needed to do adaptive reuse and to restore his historic properties. This is just one of the many classes that worked on the building. Um, right now, and I'll just give you just a couple quick um, details. Really, the average age of um, a person with the real skills that you need um, to work on one of these buildings, they're like 60, 65 years old. There's a there's a huge gap. So there's an opportunity here for Pima Community College um, to really take a visionary step and incorporate um, into uh, you know restoring and adaptively reusing these buildings, not not just the viewscape and the sense of place, which I think is important, but also real concrete learning opportunities. I think too, when we think about sustainability, because you know we're we're not thinking about the 20th century, we're faced with real sustainability issues that the students um, that I work with who. Um, and, and this building continues to be used. Uh, right now, it's in the center of campus. It's an active part of learning. Um, one of the things that Bell Preservation Society continues to do is to host a museum club. And the children, fourth grade through eighth grade, they learn about historic preservation. They learn about sustainability. Uh, they learn about their local heritage. And what I hear from, back from a lot of them is that Understanding about the place that you live um, helps them feel more at home and connected. And really understanding um, how to adaptively reuse a building, not just shove it into the landfill, not just release more carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, it makes them think about sustainability in a very different way. And, and that's another opportunity that you have. You know, um, sustainability is a, is a key issue for our future. And I think that this is a project uh, that also links to that. It, it inspires people to do their best. A lot of the, the students in the construction tech um, course, you know, when they started working on this building, they weren't really necessarily thinking about being an architect or even going on to Pima Community College or university. But working on this project inspired them to do that. And that's part of what inspired me to participate um, in this preservation trades, because I wanted to be part of, of finding the data to show that there really are jobs out there and there are connections. And so I would say the, the project that you're considering that um, would continue to provide a sense of place also could be an inspiration and a, quite a visionary project for Pima Community College to participate in. And it's much more inspiring than a parking lot. So. Great, thank you so much. Okay. Ken, will you and um, the people who spoke fill out one of our cards so we can uh, get in contact with you and have a record that you spoke? Thank you so much. Okay, so a lot of you weren't here when we first started this, so if you are interested in speaking, there are a call to the audience cards in the back, and you'll need to fill out one of those before um, you come up here to speak. And once again, uh, we're gonna be done by six o'clock, so we only have 55 minutes left. So we're gonna hold each person's comment to three minutes. Uh, be respectful and enjoy what people are saying. Be an active listener so we can all learn as much as possible from these comments. If someone has already said exactly or close to what you're gonna say, if you would defer your time and give it to somebody else who has some more information or ideas for the board to understand so we can make the best decision possible down the road when this happens. So thank you so much for being here. Um, we're gonna start with uh, Julianne Lam Lamney, I think. And our timekeeper is set. 
And are there lights up here that, that they'll see, I think? Okay. So okay. Go ahead. Thank you. So it's Julianne Lamry, Julianne. and I'm one Thank of the you. owners of 210 West Drockman Street, where your neighbor. Um, and I wanted to say, you know, when we purchased this property, uh, it looked very similar to a lot of the images you have up there. We did find that we were able to reuse, recycle, and um, repurpose a lot of the materials on site. There was a tremendous um, job ahead of us to do that, but we're very happy to be part of this community. Um, and we're interested also in how to engage and support building that community. Much of my ideas have already been stated, so I will go ahead and pass my time forward. But I wanted to say thank you so much for this opportunity to connect and um, to share the work that you're doing. We're very excited to be a partner in this neighborhood. So thank you. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is Christina Sch Scholz. Hi there, my name is Christina Scholz and I am the president of the Bronx Park Neighborhood Association. Um, I'm echoing one of our members, Julianne, who just spoke. Thank you, thank you um, for what Pima has been doing in our neighborhood. We reinvigorated our neighborhood association back in 2017 as a response, as um, basically inspired by what we were seeing in Pima. We see you guys as a leader, as an asset to our neighborhood, and as we bring in the next generation of residents and for those who are currently living there, aging in place, it's really important that we see ourselves reflected in what happens in Drachman and what I've heard from the city, what I've heard from, from Pima and some of the ideas put forward by our historical preservation advocates, it makes my heart sing and it makes me very hopeful for our future. And as a representative of an area where we have been disadvantaged, where there are real inequities around economic development, around um, ecological development, um, to echo what Carlos said, there is a moral imperative and we stand by you as advocates and as partners. We're, we're ready when called upon and we're very excited to see what you can bring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Um, Bill Christie. Is Bill Christie here? Okay, we'll move to our list. These are people who uh, registered online for our meeting. I'm not sure if you're present or if you're gonna be on a Zoom call. So we'll, we'll give you a chance either way. Um, thank you, Libby. Um, Alexander Hassel. Is it Alexander here? Alexander's comment was keep the library. So thank you, Alexander. And if you're online and we don't get to you right now, we'll come back for you if you're, if you're here. Um, our next person that registered online is Rhonda Graham. Okay, our next person who registered is Starla Celine. Starla's comment was, hello, as a former graduate of PCC's veterinary tech technology program, one of the best programs available in the state, it would be great it would be a great disservice to this outstanding program. Oh, I think that was from the, I don't think she was talking about the hotel properties. Um, but our vet tech program is amazing. Um, Michaela Hayes.
Good evening, board members, chancellor, colleagues, and guests. My name is Michaela Hayes. I'm faculty, PCCEA president, and AERC co-chair. I want to talk tonight about priorities before I share my thoughts about the future of the hotel properties. We've heard in the last couple of governing board budget presentations about large capital projects currently in place or which are needed in short-term future to continue to serve the students we currently have. At West Campus, a health profession center of excellence is not yet online, and there's a second project upgrade um, for the science lab areas on that campus as well, and both projects have budgetary commitments still to come. The 29th Street Coalition Center has issues with the HVAC system, and there are future plans to move that center to East Campus with updated facilities. As we heard at the last meeting, this needs to be done with careful planning and collaboration, but I think most people see the necessity of it. A Center of Excellence for Public Safety, PSESI, most likely at the East Campus, would be an opportunity to continue to serve students and perhaps even grow enrollment for those areas. The proposals for these options were not small amounts of money. Facilities also recently presented a large list of deferred maintenance that needs to be done throughout the college. Some of these projects are scheduled to get done this coming year, but there's more to be done than the budget will allow. Likely, there will be needed investments over the next few years to address the list of deferred maintenance items. While I love prefer preserving history, my husband's grandfather was actually one of the first professors here at Pima. Um, while I love it, and it's moving to see the passion this community has for these properties, I'm struggling to see the justification of spending millions of dollars on these properties if they won't directly impact and serve our students, or if they negatively impact our ability to make progress on other important projects. Are there possibilities for grants or partnerships that would offset significant costs of restoring these buildings that would not detract from our other projects? For years, I've heard about the idea of potentially closing the district office here and moving district staff to campuses. To that end, could these new spaces house our district office employees to move us in that direction without greatly increasing our operating expenses? I see that one of the other options for, this property, for these properties is parking. Is that a current need for our students? I know we have two other centers of excellence at that campus. Are we projecting that there is an issue? If we were to move other employees, such as district employees, into renovated buildings, would there be a projected issue? It would be a shame to see the properties turn into parking if that isn't meeting the needs of the community or campus. I want to thank the board for th thoughtfully considering their options, and I thank the community for showing passion for history and Tucson culture. I look forward to hearing how whatever plan is chosen will serve our students and our community. And I hope the community groups passionate about these projects could find a way to partner with, with PCC to work on funding these projects so the college can continue with other imp important projects as well. So, thank you, Michaela. Okay, I got another list, so we're going to have lots more speakers. Thank you. Uh, Dirk Arnold. Hi there. Thank you for having this meeting tonight. Um, my name is Dirk Arnold, and uh, I recently purchased a house at the corner of Drachman and Stone, in part because I saw that Pima Community College was interested in bringing this neighborhood up a little bit more than it has been in the past. And so I would hate to see that impression that the community has that the community college is interested in doing something suddenly be cast aside. Um, it, uh, on Instagram, when the Tucson Inn sign was relit, I just did from my own personal experience, Pima Community College got a lot of positive PR for that and also because people are saying, oh, and also they're not just fixing up this old sign, they're going to fix up the building as well. So I just thought you ought to keep those things in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Tim Hagard? Hagyard? Yeah, sure. Good. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tim Hagyard and uh, I'm a neighbor of Pima Community College. I live over in Dunbar Spring and a, a native Tucsonan. And I think it would just be a, a, a huge missed opportunity for the community if those buildings went away. Um, the downtown campus is not known for its architecture or its, in, you know, so it's a great community thing if you're going to Pima Community College. This is an outward face of Pima Community College that can reconnect the rest of the community in a way that, um, you know, that I don't think you're going to be able to do with just the, the students that go there. 
And so I think you've taken on a responsibility for the, with the community by taking on these properties. And if that's not something you're up to, I think you should give them back to the community to do something with and not, we don't need another parking lot. We have enough parking lots. If you want parking lots, um, you know, there's buses, there's shuttles, that sort of stuff. And so that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to some more of these names. Steve, Steve Mac, Mackey, Mackey, M-A-C, capital K-I-E. What about um, Richard Osseron? How about Robert Vint? Jude Hello. and Monica Cook. Hello. Okay, we'll we'll come back to Robert in a moment. Is that all right? Um, Since we have yeah. two more people walking down. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> My name is Monica Cook. Uh, together we have two businesses. Uh, one of them is Ignite Sign Art Museum, and. Um, People that come to the museum come to see historic signs and then they want to know what other ones are around Tucson. So we always send them over to the Neon Walk and, um, and then they also want to know other ones. But they, they like to stay in boutique hotels. Um, they like to stay in mid-century places because they come to Tucson for the culture. And you guys have a great opportunity here with the motels. You also have programs that would support it. You have culinary um, in your program. You have motel management. Um, why not make these student-run motels and do your training there? And then also what someone said earlier, use your programs to do the HVAC and, and train your students. Thank you, I appreciate the chance to talk. I do wanna say I really appreciate what Pima College does with workforce development in this city. Boy, do we need it. Um, these buildings are crucial to the Thrive in 05 project. It would be an error in judgment to rip these things down. I suggest, as, as I think JJ said, was to look at partnerships to help develop this. Uh, the redevelopment of this properties would be a boom to that entire area, and that's the whole purpose of the Thrive in 05. You know, we're trying to bring it back. You rip this down, you're gonna end up with any town, anywhere. And one of the things we got going is the history, and Tucson seems to appreciate the history, as we can see with the turnout here tonight. And parking, really, I'm, I'm downtown, I'm down there a lot, and that north lot is never full. With the amount of online classes you've got going, I don't think we need more parking lots. We need vision, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And also, Jude was one of the one companies that restored the Tucson Inn sign, so we're hoping that you're gonna restore the Frontier Inn too eventually and make that whole area light up. Thank you. Yeah, they are great looking signs. You guys did a great job, thank you. Um, okay, Robert is online, Robert Vint. Yes, hi, um, Bob Vint. I, uh, I'm also a native Tucsonan, as are many of the speakers here this evening. Um, I also va highly value Pima Community College. It's a great community institution. It helps a great many students advance in their careers and their lives. In fact, one of my uh, young associates in my architectural office um, did three years at Pima before transferring to the U of A to get his degree, it was more affordable, more flexible. So it's a great, great thing. Now, one thing we do need is we, in terms of workforce development, we need architects, we also need plasterers and we need tradesmen and craftsmen. And I know there's a training program at, uh, that's being discussed between the U of A and Pima to start building a cadre of preservation um, uh, trained craftsmen. Something very important as it's been observed, those of us in the field are getting rather long in the tooth and it's getting to be time to uh, train that next generation. These buildings would make the perfect project to uh, turn into a training program and build that uh, next cadre of preservationists. 
Um, so I urge you to consider all options. And once again, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Our next speaker is Herb Stratford. Ooh, loud, hot mic, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor, Chair, members of the board. Um, my name is Herb Stratford. I'm a 40-year Tucson resident and preservation professional and advocate. I live in a 1907 house. I restored an 1880s building downtown along with a 1929 Fox Tucson Theater. I'm currently restoring the 1915 Teatro Carmen in Barrio Viejo. I know firsthand what history means to a community and not only in terms of creating a sense of place but also the economic impact that comes from that. But I also work all across the country as a historic theater consultant. I've worked in more than 20 states in the past 15 years helping communities reclaim their history via historic buildings. Once these structures are gone, there's no replacement. Adaptive reuse is the only option for these properties. Uh, the power and impact of preservation on communities is nearly incalculable when all we have to do is look to our neighbor to the north to see what happens when history is absent. I would also like to address the proposed changes in cost of the project. As a veteran of multiple award-winning historic preservation projects and currently in charge of an $8 million project, Carmen, I'm baffled by the increase and would like to understand what has changed. I'm more than confident that creative solutions can be brought to bear that will limit those costs. I gladly volunteer my time to be of assistance as a preservation professional if it would help save these structures and ensure the crucial connection between Pima Community College and the larger community of Tucson. These properties will become a magnet to the community and visitors alike. That impact will not only be economic, but will be emotional. You can't manufacture nostalgia, but you can get value from it. Authenticity is what makes community unique and special. Please don't let this opportunity st and stay the course. Please don't let this opportunity go and stay the course to do the right thing. Uh, and actually, as Tim said, if you're not going to be able to restore the buildings, please let them go to someone who will restore the buildings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tammy Trujillo. Tammy Trujillo. What about John Gerard? John Jared. Okay, thank you. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes so please can. can you hear me? Yes, I'm uh, this is him at Calsa and I'm with the BCT faculty, I'm the discipline coordinator. And I'm representing John Gerard. He couldn't make it. He was at another meeting tonight. Just a quick comment. Um, based on what I heard tonight in the way of uh, historic preservation, adaptive reuse, I am a licensed architect uh, in the state of Arizona and a faculty member with the BCT department. And we just want to uh, offer up that we are in support of whatever the board decides here and happy to serve in any way we can to. Um, assist the community as well as our student learning in this opportunity. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next up, Alvaro Guevara. Guevara. What about Laura Tabili? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Laura, we can, thank you. Wow, I didn't think I'd get to speak. Um, yeah, I'm here also to urge the PCC board to recommit to restoring adaptively reusing the three uh, Drachman motels. Um, I'm reading my comments. <laughs> uh, I think repurposing these landmark properties for use, uh, particularly for student learning, as has been suggested by several people, will pay triple dividends. It will help to educate PCC students in these construction trades. They'll attract tourists during and after, right? And they'll serve as an economic engine to revitalize the Miracle Mile District and the 05, which uh, is an ongoing project. I really thought our community had learned the lessons of the tragic raising of downtown's La Calle. 
And the la I, I agree with Jude Cook that the last thing we need is more of Tucson's cultural heritage bulldoze for parking lots, which seems very counterproductive. Tucson's climate plan calls for expanded public transportation, including the Norte Sur line that we just heard about earlier in the meeting, right, that is going to connect. Uh, it's going to go right past the campus, right, with a stop at Drachman. Um, so, and of course, the city council just voted to make public transportation free indefinitely. So really, those parking lots may well be obsolete before they're even created, and that would be tragic. Um, so I think the, es the estimated cost needs to be looked into. Uh, it seems a little suspicious that it skyrocketed so much, although um, I know that construction has gone up. I think the board might want to look into those figures a little bit more. Um, and I could say more about the value of each property, the Tucson Inn, which was uh, uh, designed by Ann Risedale, who was the first woman chartered, uh, uh, licensed as an architect in Arizona and bears her distinctive style and uh, that's another story I won't go into because I'd like to uh, let other people's voices be heard. But again, I respectfully urge the board to recommit to adaptive reuse of these fascinating and evocative cultural resources. And thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Laura. Our next speaker will be uh, Raul Ramirez. Thank you, Board Chair and uh, Mr. Lambert, for the opportunity to, to address you today. Uh, I'm kind of the odd bird here because uh, most of your people here are advocating for the, the uh, historic preservation of those uh, buildings. And uh, I would say that it, this is not Pima's strength, honestly. Um, but I'll, t I'll tell you a little bit about uh, where I've been. You know, one of the buildings that I did get involved in in trying to preserve was the Marist College. And we met with the bishop, and this was when I was involved with Los Ascendientes del Presidio. And uh, the, the bishop shared that his uh, uh, advisors, uh, that included Jim Click and uh, um, Bert Lopez, had advised them that it was cheaper to knock the building down and build the new. And he, but you know what, he stuck to, the, to his guns, he worked, and he, there was a, kind of a creative energy that took place with uh, a firm from Phoenix called the um, uh, Foundation for Senior Living. And so they, they uh, included the building that the diocese had. They tore that one down and built senior living and then uh, repurposed the uh, Mayor's College. So I think something like that creative could happen, but I, I just see that this is gonna be an albatross on the neck of Pima College. Um, I was glad to see Anne, and I think she left Anne Schenecke from the city, because right now the city is working on several projects and they've been mentioned here. Uh, uh, one of them is the uh, transit oriented housing, of which Sar Norte Sur is uh, one of them. Uh, what I think could be done, and without that much cost, would be to sell the buildings to a developer that would then turn them into affordable housing. In Tucson, we have a great need, and Anne could also talked about the need. Uh, Thrive in the Five, um, the community around there is called Barrio Blue Moon, and uh, I was at a meeting with City Hall when they were talking about the uh, IID, the Infill Incentive District, and they were thinking about that grant that the city was going for, for uh, 50 million, and they said it's vital to be part of the infill incentive. So it seems to me that the, the, the key components are really there, and Pima could disinvest herself from that obligation and yet preserve the buildings with someone that would be willing to do it and provide a service in the community. One last thing about Pima College. Um, my mother graduated in 75, around the same time that I was getting my master's from ASU. 
my grandson graduated last year. It took him a little longer uh, because a lot of the classes were not available at the time that he wanted to take them. So there's still a lot of need for Pima College to strengthen your programs, and I would say there's a lot of deferred maintenance that you have to deal with. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Molly McCasson uh, via Zoom. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, Chancellor, Board, uh, everyone gathered. Um, I've, I'm a longtime Tucsonan. My family came here uh, probably down um, Miracle Mile at some point coming from Iowa in 1958. Uh, I, I just want to thank everyone for the serious consideration of a project that just seems like it could be transformative for this part of town. Um, I, I, so much has been said, I don't have to repeat it. There's been some beautiful things uh, brought up about the learning opportunities, the workforce development, um, all sorts of things um, that could go into the re, uh, adaptive reuse and the reconstructing of these historic buildings. I, for one, would really be excited uh, about the welding program. I have a scholarship that I set up at Pima in my husband's name, a welding scholarship, and I know that that kind of work would be really um, needed in this project, as well as electricians, obviously, some really challenging electrical problems. What better place to learn them than right there? And Pima College has been exemplary for hands-on education. I think this is such a beautiful opportunity and it being a gateway into the downtown, it just further integrates Pima College into the life of the community and not just the present life, but the past and the future. So uh, I, I submitted some other comments too, but I just mostly want to say, oh, please, let's not let this opportunity go by. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Teresita Majewski. Hello, can everyone hear me now? Yes, we can, thank Sorry. you. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Chancellor, Madam Chair, and members of the board for this opportunity to speak very briefly. Um, I did wanna mention, uh, give my thanks to Ken Scoville, Carlos Lozano, JJ Lamb, Tim Haggard, and uh, they're all members of the Tucson Pima County Historical Commission. And they provided useful background on Miracle Mile, historic preservation and adaptive reuse. I am chair of the commission, but I'm out of town for health reasons. And uh, I wanted to just mention a few things. And uh, 2021, the commission wrote to congratulate and commend FEMA Community College for its decision to adaptively reuse the three historic motels on, on Drachman. And uh, at that point in time, uh, the decision to purchase and adaptively reuse the building just added to your exemplary record at that time of historic preservation and contemporary placemaking um, on its campuses and as a central player within the community. Um, then in April of this year, we followed up asking you to creatively repurpose these buildings instead of demolishing them. And um, I just wanted to say that um, if, if it's not something you can do, I really encourage um, selling the buildings to someone who can do it and uh, you know understanding your mission and all those things. So. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak and thank you to the other advocates that have had wonderful suggestions and solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Nancy DeFeo. What about Eric Shamal? JJ Lamb. She already spoke. William Bird.
Honorable Board, Chair Chancellor Lambert, uh, Chair Riel, uh, thank you for holding this public study session today to hear from the community. Uh, my name is William Lawrence Bird, and for many years I worked as a, a curator at the Smithsonian in Washington before returning to Tucson, uh, where I received an MA in history uh, from the U of A in the mid-70s. And I'm pleased to speak to the board this evening as part of uh, what well, we're kind of in the public education campaign, too, of the uh, Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation and its thousands of dedicated members on whose board I sit and am representing uh, here this evening. Um, a lot of this uh, I've, st I've struck from my little talk because it's already been covered, but there are a couple of points that I wish to uh, bring up that have not yet brought, been brought up. Um, and first I'd like to remind everyone of the extraordinary collaborative work that took place between the Historic Preservation Foundation and Pima Community College. Uh, and second, the college's decade of leadership in helping to revitalize the Oracle area that's under discussion here. Uh, between two, 2009 and 2012, Pima Community College and the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation partnered to make the creative neon art walk that you see along Drachman today. Uh, college administrator Jason Brown represented PCC and served as co-chair of the Citizen Steering Committee. Uh, the Preservation Foundation raised over $150,000 through small community donations. And these funds were utilized for the restoration and installation of four classic signs, which were generously donated to the college and placed uh, on the northern edge of the campus. Um, and this project garnered national press attention and received a uh, Preservation Honor Award from the Arizona governor. And uh, Pima Community College was not merely an active participant. The college was a leader in revitalizing, uh, revitalizing revitalization initiatives through the area for over a decade. Um, and the proposed restoration of the Tucson Inn, the Frontier, and El Rancho buildings uh, further solidifies the college's commitment to the community and the work in this area consistent with its center of excellence and hospitality leadership uh, that supports the growth of Tucson's travel and tourism industry. Uh, these buildings uh, were listed on the National Register of Historic Places when the college acquired them, emphasizing their historical significance. And the board at that time understood that restoration and adaptive reuse to house college programs was the intended purpose as they were purchasing the properties. Um, and I just want to conclude with a word about the economics and frankly the politics of adaptive reuse, uh, which we believe is truly a win-win situation. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Next on our list is Alex Lim on Zoom. Hello, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I live in Nogales, Arizona, but I recognize some of the names that um, spoke up their minds today. The sense of identity that Tucson has, um, and as a newcomer to Arizona over 10 years now, it's incredible. And I think Pima Community College can really be a leader in galvanizing that energy into seeing the community that people who live in Pima County and Tucson to really enjoy and be proud of. And um, I, I, I understand the cost that was debated came out high. I'm sure there's some way to either bring it down somehow or to, like many members mentioned today, handing off the property to somebody or some entity who can actually realize um, that reflects the community's wishes. So just want to say thank you for this incredible opportunity to really listen to the community members, what they have in mind, how they feel about the places. Um, best of luck. Thank you. Uh, next, Hope Hennessy. Hello, my name is Hope Hennessy. I live downtown. My son attended Pima Community College and we're all 
grateful for that opportunity he had. Um, I urge you to listen to all of these creative solutions. I, I hear regret that the purchase was made, but it was made, and with that comes responsibility. So please take advantage of all of these great ideas, and anything else will lead to regret. I see no other path but to regret. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kylie Walzak. Kylie, are you there? Uh, hi, this is Kylie Walzak. I didn't sign up to speak. I'm, I'm, I'm listening on behalf of District 2 Supervisor Matt Hines. Okay, thanks, Kylie. Um, Carlos Lozano, you already left? Oh, you spoke already, thank you. Did you fill out a card? Will you fill out a card for me, please? Thank you. Um, Philip Zimmerman. Online, thank you. Hi, um, I, I actually didn't want to speak. I just signed up to observe the proceedings, so. Okay, thank you. We appreciate you. you being here. Thank you very much. Um, ben Lepley. What about Michael Lepley? Hmm? Marcia Spark. Jennifer, Jennifer Levstick. How about Savannah McDonald? Good evening, Chancellor, Chair, and Board. Um, I am a member of the Tucson Pima County Historic Commission, but I speak as a citizen. I am also a principal architect with a local firm and specialize in design for Southern Arizona communities, historic preservation, adaptive reuse, and affordable multifamily housing. I appreciate the opportunity to voice comments and recommendations on this important topic. These three historic Drachman hotels contribute to the Miracle Mile Historic District and importantly to the greater Tucson community's sense of place and can continue a story. The existing structures can absolutely be revived with the creative and preservationist approach to design that allows the buildings to function to meet new, modern needs while maintaining their iconic and character-defining features um, that provide reminders of our heritage, but can also serve as examples of our approach to Tucson's future. As former AIA President Carl Elefante said, the most sustainable building is the one that is already built. I would encourage consideration, even apart from the historic nature of these buildings, on the effect of our environment, the energy waste of tearing down these sturdy buildings and materials to pile up in a, in a landfill, and the role and stance of Pima Community College on these issues. As someone who is currently working on design for adaptive reuse of both the Amazon and the Noto Motel projects into affordable housing to begin to address the overwhelming, overwhelming affordable housing shortage and blight issues while protecting and upholding the qualities and features of these unique places, I understand the enormous challenges you are faced with such, with such a project. I encourage you to dig deeper into the potential of preservation and highly recommend consulting with builders who are local, well-experienced expert, and specifically with this type of work to gain accurate cost insight and realistic feedback to inform your decision-making process. I would also encourage a careful view of the greater value of these properties to our community and the influential and vibrant possibilities that a thoughtful adaptive reuse project would present here. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our list is David Smith. Uh, thanks to you all for organizing this and letting us uh, vent ourselves in front of you. Um, 
Every time I go to visit the Presidio Park in downtown Tucson, I think how great this is. It's really fantastic. But how much greater it would have been had more of it survived to the present day. Uh, I'm a city planner by training. I've worked uh, for more decades than I care to recall in the U.S. and overseas. I've also uh, project managed uh, reuse and restoration of several National Historic Register properties. I understand the challenges and difficulties. Costs are always rising. Building codes are changing and becoming more uh, complex. Uh, fitting a use into an older building can present challenges. Uh, it takes a lot of persistence, commitment, uh, creative financing, and uh, uh, just a lot of effort to make a project uh, turn out properly, but it can be done. It's done all the time, everywhere throughout the country. It just takes the resolve on the part of the owner, the technicians, and the specialists who work on the project, and the community. Uh, my wife and I have lived here in Pima County for over 20 years. We've taken courses at the West Campus. Um, I've been very impressed with the entire uh, Pima College network and the opportunities that it presents uh, to all of the citizens of the county and the educational opportunities that uh, can be realized. The uh, students, the faculty, the facilities at the West Campus, where I'm most familiar, are fantastic. Uh, but it's not just the educational experiences in the classroom that matter. This institution as a whole, through the board, delivers messages to the community by what you decide and what actions you take. If, if these buildings are erased, uh, they cannot be replaced. And that will be a very strong message to the community, which I think would be uh, highly regrettable. So thank you. Bobby Joe Buell Carter. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I've lived downtown for 42 years now in the barrio. When I first moved in, people asked me, why, why would you want to live there? And I will say it's taken a long time. And now it's a neighborhood that it seems virtually everybody wants to live in. Um, it speaks to what Tucsonans value and also what helps drive our economy. Um, this is the season where in my neighborhood now, everybody's taking their high school graduation photos. Yesterday, five groups I saw taking their high school graduation photos. Wedding photos, quinceanera photos. Tucsonans value the heritage of the city. It's one of the reasons we want to live here. It brings tourists. In our neighborhood, there's walking tours every single day of the week now. There's people painting the buildings. You have buildings downtown that they might look like a wreck right now, and I'll grant you they do. They look terrible. But one of the things that I also have done in my 42 years is that my husband and I restored more than a dozen buildings downtown, including an apartment complex that, yep, it was condemned, surrounded by razor wire fence. And it takes a long time to see what the future might look like and what people might value. But I promise you, I mean, we won't be alive 42 years from now probably, but th the buildings you own, they will be valued. And that stretch of the city will come back if you don't level it. Seize the opportunity. And if you don't have the stomach for it, that's fine. Sell the properties to somebody who does value them. There's no harm in walking away from it. But demolition, you can't reverse it. And the parking lots, people have said it, there couldn't be a worse possible use. Thank you. Martin Hernandez. Martin? No. Um, Deborah Zelnio? Okay, thank you, Deborah. Uh, Melissa Fogel? Uh, Catherine McKinney? Okay. Kathy.
Catherine, are you there online? Hi, Catherine. We see your name. Are you ready to speak? Okay, we'll come back to Catherine. Um, Michael Edmonds. Um, first of all, let me say I hadn't planned on speaking, but since my name was on the list and I got called, uh, at minimum, well, first, I thank you all for coming. Uh, everybody, thank you for coming. Thanks to uh, news media for coming. Um, let me introduce myself. Uh, my, name, my name is Mike Edmonds, and I'm the former president of Tucson House, a residence council, <laughs> and um, I'm in the Barrio Blue Moon Neighborhood Association, because Tucson House is in that area. I'm the former vice chair of the Commission on Equitable Housing and Development for the city of Tucson, and I'm also ambassador for the housing, uh, I'm sorry, uh, high capacity transit line. Uh, some call it rail, you know, high, high speed rail. It, I'm not sure that it's been chosen yet, whether it's gonna be rail or bus. Uh, we've been out gathering information and sharing information about, about the line. I'm also the community liaison for War 3 for Councilman Kevin Dahl. Thanks, Kev. Um, have, I, just a quick question. Have you all been in the Thrive Neal 5 area? Have you walked around and you say, okay, I just, I didn't know. Because all I want to really say is I see a lot of opportunities and possibilities. I've been saying that for three, maybe four years now. I think I'm coming up four years now in Tucson House and just being involved in Thrive Neal 5. Um, I invite you to contact me if you have any questions about the Thrive area, about the area that you're thinking about making some, you know, changes to, modifications to. And um, again, just real quick, thanks everybody for coming. I didn't expect this many people to come. Um, and, and feel free to reach out to me at the War 3 office if I can be in, of any assistance and help. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Gretchen Lueck. Hi, um, I'm a Pima alumni. I'm really glad to be here tonight. Also live in Feldman's, which is just on the other side of Stone from the project. Uh, one of the things I was most excited about hearing about the project was the culinary piece. Um, we are a city of gastronomy, the first in the country, as we all know. And I think it would be amazing if we had sort of a more public um, culinary piece, uh, training, maybe an open area where people can go and buy meals um, to sample some of our fabulous culinary expertise here. And the other piece of that is our restaurants here desperately need trained staff. I don't know if you've been out to eat lately. Service is not what it used to be. Restaurants are having to close for certain days and certain hours. Um, and as far as the um, some of the properties, maybe they could be offices or dorms, if not any of the aforementioned things. Um, this this these properties, these hotels are an integral piece of historic Highway 80. And as many people have said, preservation makes a destination. People are coming to Tucson partly because of our history as well as the natural beauty. And it just doesn't seem like demolition jives with the Thrive in 05. So thank you. Thank you. Susan Shin Dehet. Dehet. Thank you so much. I had no intention of speaking here, but um, I. Right up in the microphone, if you would. I'm sorry. Mind. Thank you. Throw my two cents in. Um, it's the perspective I haven't heard here, and that is from the outside from the far outside. I'm a newbie. I've only been here six years. Um, I was the top writer at People Magazine in New York, and I'm originally from Eight Mile in Detroit. I have seen communities change in many different ways. Um, when I lived in DC, I needed to find a place to live, driving around not far from where the riots had taken place in DC, 3rd and G Northeast, saw a huge red brick building with turrets, all kinds of construction going on. I had no idea. I went in, started asking questions. It was an 1892 schoolhouse that had been abandoned to junkies. And 
Um, a developer, very cool guy, came in, fixed it all up, 10-foot ceilings, batons to open up the windows, fireplaces. It became one of the most extraordinary residential buildings in D.C. I had no idea. It was the first adaptive reuse building, residential, in Washington, D.C. Then, not too long after that, I found an old house for $30,000 on the western shore of the Chesapeake, and a guy and I redid it. I mean, scotch tape and a prayer, but we did it. The town that this house was in had been off limits to sailors in World War II. Gambling, prostitution, horrible. Everyone said, what are you going there for? Why are you, you were living in 3rd and G Northeast. What are you doing this stuff for? We fixed up this little house. It was on the cover of the Washington Post home section. So I'm just saying I've seen these things. I moved out. I got done with New York. Moved out here, threw a dart at a map. A friend of mine had bought some property north of town. She said, come on, you got to see this place. I thought, oh, guys in golf pants and stuff. I had no idea. <laughs> I came out here. Someone took me to San Avir. I met a Ronstadt. I went to Tumacockery. I've been in refugee camps in Pakistan. I've done a lot of stuff. Wrote two New York Times bestsellers. And it happened within 48 hours. I stayed at the Arizona Inn and looked at the history and read about Greenway and what had that place had been. And I told my friends in New York, this is as exotic and authentic a place as I have ever been anywhere. And none of them believed me. None of them believed me. And I'm sure you're all aware that in the space of three months, Tucson was named on the Time.com website, I had worked for Time Magazine in Washington, and also the New York Times as one of the places that you have to visit in 2023. I sent it to everybody. I put it on Facebook, and my friends all said, only you, Shindahat, only you. <laughs> so I'm in a little house in Blenman. Does that I have to stop? Yeah. OK. <laughs> but what? But Susan, that was an amazing uh, bit that you shared with us. And, okay. And we just want to thank all of you for being here. We really appreciate everything you shared with us. It is a decision that the board is going to have to make at some point. Um, I just want to say one thing. We never decided to put in more parking lots, right? That wasn't an idea. So please be, uh, you know, rest assured that we're going to make the best decision that we can make that will improve student education, improve the bit of the college in the community. We want to try to do it all. We're not sure how that will happen, but we're not making this decision lightly. So thank you for being here. And keep in touch if you have more information you want to share with us. Thank so, so, you. so Madam Chair, I just wanted to note that I was receiving emails from people who were online, and I let them know that we will add their comments to the record. So we're going to move to adjourn this meeting. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you all.